making plans for night you This boy is electric well, July came and went pretty quick, didn't it? Uh, apologies for being a bit late in doing this video, but uh, I haven't been feeling quite well over the last couple of weeks, so uh, that's the main reason why I've been a little late in posting this video. Anyway, feeling a bit brighter now, so time to get the camera out, time to tell you about how we got on in July. The message I'd like to get across though in this video is a little bit more than just the great statistics, the great amount of solar energy we've had in July. And I want to ask the question really, it's what do you expect of a solar home? What do you expect of an eco home? What do you expect of a modern energy efficient home? Whenever I think about it and I see images of um, zero bill homes and eco homes, they're always like architect designed houses with that wonderful trio of um, materials being used, cedar cladding and gray uh, windows, all, all that sort of thing. And I think it's a bit of a shame that the media or the marketing, the advertising for what is an eco home or an energy efficient home is portrayed as something special, something different. You know, all these passive house type things where they spend a fortune on building it to certain standards, insulating it to massive standards so you don't have high energy requirements and all of those things, while they're great, they're not necessarily necessary for you to have an eco home, for you to have a efficient home. And I think uh, what I'm doing here in Norfolk is a good example of that. You know, we've got an ordinary house. It's a four bedroom house built 15 to 20 years ago. Oh, I can't remember exactly when it was built. And yet it is very, very efficient. We don't pay for any energy. We are a zero bill home at the moment. We have enough solar power for most of our needs apart from a couple of months uh, a year in the winter period where we do import cheap rate energy and use that to heat our home, charge our cars, do the cooking, heat the hot water, do everything. We don't use any oil, any gas, any petrol, any diesel, none of it. It's all electricity, it's all green, it's all renewable either through Octopus Energy or generate it ourselves. So the only question is the choice about whether it's more cost effective, whether it's whether we can make a profit from exporting the energy to the grid instead of using it, or whether if there isn't at some point profit to be made by exporting it, whether we consume it. So we have the choice, we consume our solar energy or we export it. If we export it and make a profit, that pays for the winter bills. If of course, at some point we don't get paid at all for our export, then there won't be any credit being built up for winter. So at some point, I might have to pay electricity bills of 30 or 40 pounds a month for two months a year. But does that mean I'm not an eco home because I don't have cedar cladding on the house and it doesn't look like an architect designed house? I don't think so. So the reason for saying that, the reason for the thumbnail is to encourage other people. You don't have to have a special house. You don't have to spend a fortune on changing your house structurally or the insulation. By adding your own solar panels and your battery system, you're changing how you consume energy. I find it a little sad when uh, I see comments to some of my videos and other people's videos saying, you know, I can't do that, I can't go electric, I can't have a heat pump, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. It's all so negative. And what I try to convey in my videos that I produce each month is that for us here, it changes every month. And for us, it's been a journey. We didn't achieve it all in one go. You don't have to have a big pot of cash. Some of the solar that we've installed only cost £1,500 to install a good solar array in the garden. Some of the solar arrays that we've installed cost three or £4,000. They cost more money. So if you do it in a staged approach over several years, you can get there. You can get to a point where you are energy independent and you can get to the point where you truly are energy efficient. You truly are independent and using just renewable energy. And of course your bills come right, right down to either almost nothing or nothing at all. This year we're going to be in credit by about £700. £700! So even if the export payments disappeared completely, which of course they're not going to, then I'm probably still going to be in credit for many years to come. So it's about when to do these things. The fact that I've done it early means that I'm ahead of the game. Being ahead of the game seems a little bit odd because it didn't seem 
unusual what we've done it just seemed an obvious journey start with solar panels get yourself an electric car to use some of that energy you've still got some energy left over so convert that oil boiler or gas boiler to an electric heating system now we've got air conditioning and a really efficient winter heating system we've also got less radiators in the house so we've got much more space everything in the house is much much better having gone electric same with the cars isn't it once you've gone to electric you just understand that they're better they're more efficient they're more economical they're more reliable they're nicer to drive they're smoother they're easier and there's no dirty smells coming out of the back the stigma of having an electric car when other people think they can't is gradually changing isn't it because you know instead of being a rich bugger that can afford an electric car now everyone's buying them so it's becoming normal and that's what I think is going to happen to uh, homes too. What I've done here is going to be normal. Going electric, getting rid of the gas and oil boiler, adding solar panels, adding a home storage battery, putting air to air heating in so you've got air conditioning as well as an efficient heating system. Those things are going to be absolutely normal. And I forgot, don't forget your hot water tank. You know, we changed across to a smart Mixergy hot water tank and have never looked back. It's the third biggest use of energy in the house so it's a big item to be more efficient with we used to put 100 kilowatt hours into our hot water now we're putting less than 40 kilowatt hours in and there we go let's move on to the stats for the month of july and there is a record we have recorded in july the lowest amount of hot water heating ever in the lifetime of us recording this data so it's not because we used less hot water it's simply because I've been gradually fine-tuning the algorithms and the automation and the smartness that we have with our hot water tank using both the Eddy and the Mixergy hot water tank to minimise the amount of hot water heating we do. The idea is it's heated to just the temperature we want, just in time, and we have just enough. And if it can be smart enough, then we hardly use any, less than 40 kilowatt hours a month. So that's what, 1.3 kilowatt hours a day on average? I mean, that is tiny. So how have we got on with solar generation for the month of July? It hasn't been quite as good as the previous months. But 1.2 megawatt hours, 1,224 kilowatt hours for the month of July, that'll do nicely. Compared to previous months, though, on the very right-hand side of this graph, you can see that at 1.2 megawatt hours, it's down on the last four months. So even March had more solar energy generated than July. July, though, seems to be one of those really, really consistent months where you can predict how much energy you're going to have. I mean, look at the last three years for our main array, 519, 512, 518. It's so, so close every July. So it's been a normal July. It's just that March, April, May and June previously were really, really good. The day-by-day -day breakdown uh, is as follows, 518 kilowatt hours for our south-facing array, 3.9 kilowatts of solar panels, roof mounted. And as you can see there, we were peaking at around 26 kilowatt hours a day. And then we had 225 kilowatt hours from our 2.5 kilowatt solace inverter. That's got uh, two strings, 1.1 kilowatts on our garage roof south facing and 1.8 kilowatts east facing on our gable wall. The peak there was about 11 kilowatts. Our garden mounted solar panels that are just uh, sat on some sleepers with some triangular frames. There's uh, six 400 watt panels there, 2.4 kilowatts. It's south facing, generated another 188 kilowatt hours. And finally, our last array, it's a solar edge inverter, 2 kilowatt inverter, 2.4 kilowatts of solar panels. It's south facing on the roof, 293 kilowatt hours. It's the analysis and the comparison of all of these different arrays and different amounts of solar panels that really intrigues me. So these two items, 225 kilowatt hours and 188 kilowatt hours, that's our garden mounted solar panels and the ones on the garage and the east facing gable. What's interesting there is the 188 is lower than March and yet the gable facing solar panels, the 1.1 plus 1.8, 
uh, array, 225 kilowatt hours, is more than March. So proportionally, you can see that the uh, east-facing gable panels and the ones on the garage roof are still performing better than the garden solar panels. I think what's happening, um, I think I've mentioned before, in the garden solar panels, I'm now getting plants and trees and leaves shading them more than when they're on the roof. So lower down are more impacted by the shade. I'm wondering, as autumn approaches and the plants die down, whether that swing will uh, change again and we'll see the garden solar panels start to outperform that east-facing gable array. But then there's the solar edge array that proportionately the number of kilowatt hours generated per kilowatt of solar panels is 122.08, which is down from our main solace inverter of 132.82. And yet both of them are on the same roof, same direction, same amount of shade, Solar Edge just doesn't quite perform as well as Solace. So it does make me wonder one day whether I should de-implement that Solar Edge inverter, take away the inverter from the original Solace installation as well, and put a large, say, 6 kilowatt inverter in to cover all of those panels, and I'll start to generate even more. But is it, is it worth it for the marginal gain? Probably not, but it would be interesting to see the extra that could be generated from a different inverter. Another observation of solar is the declining peak power that we're generating. This chart showing from May through to July, you can really see that we were peaking at 10.4 kilowatts back in May, and that's gradually been declining. The number of times we're peaking high is reducing, but the actual peak now is definitely declining in July. Yep, autumn's on the way. Taking that analysis further, looking at just two of our arrays, these are the two that are on the roof uh, of the main house, 3.6 kilowatt solace inverter and the solar edge 2 kilowatt inverter. Both of those, as you can see here, are maxing out at the 3.6 kilowatt um, inverter limit in blue and the yellow, the 2 kilowatt inverter of the solar edge inverter. So we're not seeing a decline in those two arrays from um, May through to July. It's the other arrays that I'm seeing the decline in. The east-facing gable panels, for example, yep, there's a definite decline in the peak amount of power that we're seeing in July compared to May. I love this sort of breakdown. It's just such a shame that all the other apps don't show this. Getting all of the data into Home Assistant and allowing you to look at it all and compare it all. It is brilliant to be able to see these things and understand the, I don't know, the truth behind all of these numbers. Moving on to the electricity that we're paying for, what we're importing from the grid through Octopus Energy and also what we're exporting and being paid for. Uh, our direct debit remains at one pound. We uh, received 177.54 for electricity exported and paid for 43.23 and £3.97. There was a um, tariff change and hence the two amounts of electricity we're paying for. So another month at over £100 net credit. Doing really well. That's 523 kilowatt hours imported from Octopus Energy from the grid. Uh, the higher spikes there, that's when we're charging the electric car. Otherwise, we're just charging the home storage battery during the evening. A little bit of hot water heating and running the base load overnight. Adding that to the chart, just looking at grid import numbers on the far right hand side, 522, 523 kilowatt hours. That's pretty normal. Um, it's not particularly high and it's not particularly low. So our energy usage is looking about normal. The excess solar that we don't have a use for, so we're using our base load of the house during the day and then anything left over we're exporting for 15 pence a kilowatt hour. We exported 1,213 kilowatt hours. Not too bad. I mean, in fact, that's a really healthy amount because it gave us a good net credit. Adding that to the chart, looking at just export though, you can see it is slightly lower than the last four months. So even exporting with a battery, July just wasn't as good as March, April, May and June. Year to date's looking pretty good as well. We've exported 6,923 kilowatt hours versus importing 3,524 kilowatt hours. And the fact that we're importing at 7 pence and exporting at 15 pence, more than twice that amount, that shows why we're in net credit for the year. So we're building up a nice credit to make sure we're very comfortable in winter and we're going to have a net credit overall at the end of the year. So yeah, no bills, zero bill home. It's what we want to see. More houses should be like this. It is possible. 
Moving on to battery usage, this is a Victron inverter looking after the batteries, Pylon Tech batteries in the background, uh, cabinet mounted in our garage. We've got about 30 kilowatt hours usable power from those batteries. This chart is showing that we've only got two spikes up to 100%, so we've only filled it to 100% twice in the month. And we've dropped down to 40-ish percent most of the days, which is where we are exporting energy in the evening down to that level. So we're only using 40, 45 percent of our battery capacity. I'm not pushing the batteries to their limit. For those interested in the detail, these are the Victron settings that I use for charging our battery overnight from the grid. So it's set for every day to start at midnight, not at half past 11. I start at midnight, even though there's an extra half an hour of cheap rate energy that I could be using and uh, we run it until 529 not 530 uh, 529 because it gives it that last minute of adjusting to make sure we don't use any peak rate energy because after it stops charging it will adjust down and then uh, it does take about 30 40 seconds for the battery to change over from being charging from the grid to actually discharging and looking after the loads and I'm only charging to 85%, leaving some headroom for the day so that when we reek peak solar power generation, which goes above our export limit, I can charge the battery and hence avoid that export limit. And that's why I leave that little bit of headroom. But now I've actually changed the schedule to charge to 100% overnight because those peaks that we're receiving during the day are reducing. So I don't need to worry about the export limit. Hot water, as I mentioned, it was a record month where we've used the least amount of energy to heat our hot water. This chart showing our hot water heating going back to, I think, 2019 really shows what's been going on and how much energy we were using when we were just using an eddy to heat a normal hot water tank. And then uh, in 2020. To 2000, yeah, 2022, we installed the mixed hot water tank and we've gradually been using less and less energy each month as I get used to it and work out the most optimum way of running that hot water tank. I do, I do love it when you can see data like this and see the improvement you're making over time. It just makes sense. I know some of you like to compare uh, my energy data. So here's mine. 1.4 megawatt hours of generation, which I know was really only 1.2. Uh, consumption, 800 kilowatt hours, 567 kilowatt hours imported, 232 kilowatt hours of solar energy consumed and exported, 1,181. So yeah, the numbers are slightly different, but those are the numbers that uh, my energy app has recorded. Only 29% green. Well, that's not true, is it? Usage-wise, as I said, 39.9 kilowatt hours from the eddy to heat hot water. The Zappi was 173.8 kilowatt hours consumed. So not a massive amount. Uh, we're down to one electric car now, just the Kia Soul, and 587.8 kilowatt hours consumed in the house, including battery charging. And the final chart I'm going to show you is about temperatures. This chart is showing an entire year's worth of data for the lounge, garage and hallway. So the lounge in orange peaking uh, last year around August, September time at 30 degrees, dropping down to five degrees. Again, this is our uh, garage temperature, so not the outside temperature. And then uh, from January, it just starts to increase continually. And we've had those same 30 degree plus peaks, but earlier this year, they're in June and July, not August, September as it was last year. But the blue and yellow lines for our lounge and hallway, those are obviously remaining more constant around the 20 degrees because we're heating in the winter and cooling in the summer. Okay, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope there's some useful information there for you. And the message to others is about getting started, getting your foot in the water of solar batteries, electric cars, going electric. The sooner you do it, the sooner you make the benefits and the sooner you are further ahead than other people. Don't be last. There's uh, plenty of benefit to be gained in going electric. Take care. See you again soon. Bye for now.